it out. Peter, do you want to talk to us about um, recreating old beers? Oh, I guess so. Um, could everybody mute, please? That would be handy uh, so that we don't end up with disturbance. All the questions at the end, please. And um, uh, the host has disabled screen sharing, Darren. Oh, God, really? <laughs> oh, yes, really. There you go. You should be allowed now. That is much better. Okay. So, we should be all good. Everybody see the screen okay? Nod, good. Yeah, all good. Okay. So, um, I've been uh, brewing for over 22 years. I've been imbibing for considerably longer. Uh, I've got a graduate certificate in brewing from Ballarat, and I did the concise course at the Siebel Institute in, um, in Chicago. I've uh, been a recognized judge and don't find the need to, uh, under the old system, and haven't found the need to, uh, uh, or the motivation to go any further with that. And I've been doing um, all this research since 2009. So why is the big question? Well, basically it's Jamil Zainashev's fault. Uh, he came to the Australian National um, Conference in uh, Melbourne and we hung out with, uh, this is Barry Cranston and myself and uh, with him and uh, John Palmer. And we struck up a, a bit of a friendship and he, when he got back to the States, asked me whether I would talk about Australian sparkling ale on, uh, on his style show on the Brewing Network. So I rushed off into the State Library of New South Wales and went and had a rummage and see what I could find. And I found a little bit of information and I put together a, uh, my initial thoughts on Australian sparkling ale. So that really set me off. And I did wonder why there was nothing written about old Australian beers. And that has resulted in three books so far. Uh, Bronze Brews, which was mainly about Australian beers with some comparisons to UK beers. Six O'Clock Brews has got a lot about uh, Coopers because uh, Dr. Tim Cooper, after I asked nicely, let me into his archives. Uh, and I got to see out of the company safe, the, uh, the very original 1862 logbook by his forefather, fathers. Um, and Gal Brews, which is one I've published this year, which is uh, Cornish, Irish and English beers uh, with lots of information about party garling and sugars and all sorts of other stuff. So my talk today is related to how you go about producing and recreating these recipes. So the picture we've got here is from uh, the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences, commonly known as the Powerhouse Museum. And this is the Bolton and Watt 1785 Whitbread Brewery engine, which was donated on the centenary of the invasion of Australia in 1888 uh, to the museum. And it actually, can still function. They do pipe live, they can pipe live steam to it. I don't know when they last run it, but um, it's still in the museum in somewhat of the working order. So this is a, a natural thing to talk about. You're in London and we're going to talk about Whitbread and in particular double brown ale. So just like in Australia, Australia has a has an online archive called Trove, which is free. Uh, in the UK, you've got uh, uh, a similar newspaper archive that you have to pay an arm and a leg for every year. 
And you can see a bit of heritage um, uh, advertising here from 1949, which shows the same engine. And the technology in use uh, was cutting edge of the day, I guess. So what we're gonna go through is how I get to the recipes. So we're going to do recreating the Whitbread Double Brown Ale, and then we're gonna do an interpretation of Toos Double Brown Ale. And I'll explain more about Toos later on, and then afterwards we can do some Q&A. So it isn't just looking at um, uh, production logs in the brewery, in brewery archives. Also look at contexts like adverts, and you can see one on the right of this slide here uh, about the advertising, because uh, marketing has never really uh, gone away. It still exists, and it existed back in the 1930s. And then I'm gonna go through some archaic measurement details, and then I'm gonna deconstruct the production log of Double Brown Ale, and we'll go through the brewing processes as we dissect the record. So I found this particular um, uh, diagram inside uh, a 1909 Cooper's Brewing Book. That's Cooper's as in sparkling ale. And nearly all the archaic measurements uh, from both UK and Australia, we're talking about imperial barrels, obviously, 36 gallons, and the measurement of um, specific gravity was done in pounds per barrel rather than um, what we're more used to or, or Plato and etc cetera, etc cetera. but most of the uh, the English based uh, information is in pounds per barrel so this is a, a useful little um, uh, handy chart uh, to get to it but there's the formula for how you get pounds per barrel to specific gravity so I've developed uh, a spreadsheet with all the necessary conversions in the cells to be able to change pounds per barrel to specific gravity, to convert hogsheads, 54 gallons, into barrels, and then pounds per barrel to grams per litre, which is uh, particularly useful for um, uh, many different things like uh, caramel additions, etc., And then ounces per barrel to grams per litre. Typically, that would be related to uh, dry hopping amounts, where if you're lucky, the log might say uh, eight ounces per barrel, and that's 1.39 grams per litre, etc. Then, of course, we have F to C, because nearly everything was in F. Uh, and you get to some of the more continental uh, uh, and American uh, information, and they use Riemer, which is a bit of a weird one, but that's handy to have that conversion. The more modern ones are in degrees Balling or Plato, uh, so I need a conversion for that to get it to more familiar, at least for homebrewers, SG. And then with with that information, I found three different formulae to actually get from SG to Plato. They're all there, thereabouts. Uh, so I sort of split the difference at uh, the accurate one being the one in the middle. And I've gone with the, um, the UK excise notice 226 definition of how you adjust for um, ABV because unlike Australia, uh, the excise is calculated on ABV in the UK, uh, whereas here it's just a very simple, whether it's a low alcohol beer or whether it's a full strength beer, and that's how they do the calculations. So I've gone with um, this calculation because it compensates for uh, the gravity with the alcoholic strength. Um, so once you've got all that information, the things that you don't get from these old production logs are, are color and 
IBUs. Now, I'm going to go through the, the recipe in full in a moment, but there's just a couple of things to point out here that with the chosen equivalent materials in, in both the mash and the, and the copper, I work out what the EBC is in, in Brewfather. And I also calculate using the tinsel formula in, in the same program to get the IBUs. What's noticeable here, and we'll come back to this later, is that if I compare it to the BJCP style 13B, which is British Brown Ale uh, as defined, you can see it's off the chart as far as IBUs are concerned. And we'll come back to that. Now, I, I used to use um, ProMash, and I still think it's uh, a very sound program. It's just that the user interface and its interface to things uh, for tracking you know, your eye spindles and, and the like uh, is just not there. So it's a dead product, basically. So I've, I've converted uh, the bulk of my archive into from XML files into Brewfather. And if you've not used it, I would highly recommend it. I found it a very usable program. Right now, so there's the basic tool set. And now we have to go and find some information. Now, sitting in the middle of London is the London Metropolitan Archives. And the way that I've gone about this, uh, and I must give credit to Ron Pattinson of Shut Up About Barclay Perkins fame, because I followed his blog for years and did some of his recipes and only knew of the existence of uh, the LMA from his writings. So you can go on there, uh, you get your, you do a search, you have a look at it. There's more than Whitbread there in terms of old breweries. And then you, you sign up and you pay, you, turn, you, you book it all online, you pay your photography fee when you get there. And in 2016, it was five quid. And off you go and you photograph away to your heart's content. It doesn't look much from the outside, but what it contains are lots of books like this. And this is a 1932 Whitbread double brown. So what's, what we're gonna go through is each of the sections of the log and I'll, I'll talk through each of the sections and how they're all worked out. So first off, liquor treatment. Now, the one thing about very established old breweries is that they didn't change much over the years. Now, whilst I don't have a 1930s liquor treatment, their brewery manual that's in the archive uh, actually talks about how they were treating their liquor and they were using salt. And as you can see, that's uh, an addition that you could make. Uh, I've gone away from being prescriptive about water treatments. Uh, I've used Martin Brungard's Brew and Water program, and that has a range of profiles. Uh, the one thing I would counsel against about is about using old uh, water profiles from some of the published rubbish on the internet, because I don't think that's going to work for you because you're trying to get a nice beer out of this. And if you are making a good brown beer at the moment, and you've got a set of water treatments that work for that, it should work for this. Now we do need to talk about quarters and bushels, a few more archaic measurements. So we have eight bushels making one quarter, but a bushel of what? Depending what you're weighing, you will get different weights. Now by custom and practice, when a brewery was, was buying malt, they knew what weight to expect from a bushel. So in the UK, a quarter of base malt was nominally 336 pounds. Interestingly, I found that a Australian quarter was 320 pounds. There you go. So in other Whitbread records, 
can determine that the pale base malt was 41 pounds a bushel and the chocolate malt was 30 and a half. And they're the two major ones we need to, we need to look at. Now I'm going to mention uh, a contemporary report, contemporary as in 1928. Tuss was a very large brewery in Sydney and they sent their brewers on fairly regular basis for jollies around the world. And Martin Hoare's report is in the archive in Canberra and he visited Whitbread. So I will mention a few things about uh, Whitbread and Chiswell Street in particular from his report. So having a contemporary report by a, a guy that was the head brewer is, is a very handy thing to have. So he said that all the malt was delivered in canvas sacks, emptied into an elevator, and it had an automatic weighing system. So on the left is the original log, and on the right we have that broken down into something that's a bit more legible. The, the writing in this particular log is, is not too bad. Uh, many logs, it's virtually indecipherable from scribble. So what we've got here is a mix of Californian, and in this period, uh, Californian malt, the, the brewers liked something that was a bit bright. And six row malt uh, from California or from Tunisia or from Australia was, was quite often used. Then you've got some pale ale malt, couple of different suppliers. Now that's not French chocolate malt from France, that's French as in French and Jupp, who were maltsters somewhere up in Hertfordshire, I think. And then you've got sugar. So you've got Albion, number three invert. And then something that I've not managed to track down, it's called SI, I think, from the log. It might be coloring, it might be caramel. And from the details in one of the other ledgers, it was fairly expensive. So not quite sure what that is, but it was a relatively small amount. Whoops. So what we've got here is a total grist of, uh, for mashing of 55 quarters. Uh, a quarter of 200 weights of sugar equals a quarter. And so your total materials are 75.5 quarters, which we'll need a bit later on. So this is another thing, uh, another picture from uh, the Sphere in 1960. And uh, I think you can safely say that, that uh, Whitbread weren't that keen on spending money on their plant. So I think we could assume it, this is pretty much the same plant. So we've got what Martin Hoare said, it's a, and I'll read this out, an, an infusion process. Uh, the tons were copper jacketed with wood, with the copper kept bright, as in shiny. Uh, had um, rakes, motor driven, but they had to actually get a, get a bloke, and it probably was a bloke, into the mash tun to clean it out. It wasn't automatically emptied at all. So a fairly rudimentary and primitive system in 1928. They might have changed the, the mashing a bit later on, perhaps. So with the mash, we have two different mashes. So we have two infusion mashes. Let's call them guiles. The first mash, you've got a, a higher strike temperature, as you would expect, but the basic stand temperature was 65 centigrade. So nothing too controversial there uh, and they'd run that off into the copper and uh, boil that one up and then they did a, a remash in effect of the second mash at a higher temperature uh, as a very uh, efficient um, uh, system of mashing so they kept these two guiles separate so with the boil they apportion different amounts of um, sugar to um, each of the boil. There was more in the second boil than there was in the first boil. So 80 minute boil time. 
uh, quite a reasonable uh, gravity, 1065, uh, boiling down, boiling down to uh, 1076, and the second boil was 1025. And they they added Irish moss jelly, so that's uh, their findings. So around 13, 14 percent um, evaporation uh, from the boil. Now with the hopping, the log could be somewhat confusing. the The total quantity here is seven hundred and fifty five pounds. Uh, and you've got Whitbread Mid Kent and uh, Golding or Fuggle uh, with the word, a little bit of um, uh, bracketed there, CS, Cold Store. So the, the hops here probably came from uh, Whitbread's own hop garden, uh, which they, they bought in 1919. Uh, I think it's a theme park now. Uh, as is all things, time goes on. Uh, so you've got 25% of, we're in 1932, so you've got 25% of uh, the previous years, and then you've got 75% of uh, two years old. So if we look in the, in the column there, where it says 3130, that's 1931, etc. And the other measure that you use to determine hopping rates, uh, independent of volume, is pounds per quarter. So we've got 10 pounds per quarter here. Uh, and looking in H. Lloyd Hind, his textbook is something that you can rely on, I think, uh, unlike some textbooks. And he said for pale ale hopping, you, you're looking at around 10 pounds per quarter for 1055 beer. So we have a brown ale here that is hopped like a pale ale. And that's what that makes this one somewhat different. 10 pounds per, bar per quarter. So now we've got the hopping rates the first thing to do is to establish a, a suitable equivalent for the hop variety. Now, most of the, uh, most of the records have details of where they bought it from, either by the factor or the grower, uh, which makes it tricky. But then again, what they were buying was typically English hops in this period because they put a big tariff on uh, on hops from the US notably and then apply some discounts depending on which era you're in because of the factors like they were using whole seeded hops and seeded hops uh, have a, a fair percentage of um, of seeds in them which add no brewing value they're not adding any bitterness and if anything they might add some har harshness uh, by the 1920s, as we saw, most storage conditions were pretty good, so they realized about the uh, importance of keeping the hops uh, under cold storage conditions. Age, well, we had one-year-old and two-year-old. And, of course, today, in the main, we would use pellets, and all of these recreations I've used pellets. As far as the hop addition times, it's rare to find hard hard data uh, the the hundreds of logs probably thousands by now that i've seen when a new brewer took over they tended to write things down from the tacit knowledge that uh, existed in the brewery as to when you added what and when and that's useful because it gives you an idea what's happening here with a with a brown beer uh, I've decided that this was all first word hopping. So we have uh, the pounds per barrel translated into grams per litre. And because of the factors of the 1930s, I've discounted by one third to get a hopping rate of, of 4.11 grams per litre. 
alpha acids four to six for the types of hops being used seems reasonable. So we can move on. Also on the sheet, and just for completeness, uh, most big breweries were very keen to understand uh, that they were getting the right level of efficiency out of the, um, uh, out of the materials they were putting in the mash tun. Uh, this efficiency calculation works out pretty well, uh, but they didn't include the chocolate malt in their efficiency calculation for some reason. Now, because they were um, uh, using two coppers, the question cropped up about if you were to brew this exactly per the log and do it with two separate coppers, which, which hops should go in which copper? And again, the log is silent on this, but I would suspect based on uh, other information that the hops were added in proportion to the gravity of the copper. And by looking at what they've got there, it looks like a 75, 25% split based on the gravities. Not exactly, but you know, it's a production log, so it's going to have some variability in it, but in that order of magnitude. So if you were to do this per the log and not combine it all into one guile, then uh, that would be my suggestion for the hop additions and all first work. Now this is a picture of the tun room again from the sphere. Uh, Martin Hoare said that they, in 1928, they were actually using paraflow para refrigeration, uh, which is quite a, a modern way of cooling. Uh, so his notes were 36 hours in the fermentation squares, which are the ones to the left of the picture up on that gantry. And then it was dropped into the tanks below and the yeast skimmed off automatically. So the tanks below are the uh, bottom right. And then they put it through something called a Scots press, which then pressed the yeast out for reuse. Uh, he noted that, the, chi, uh, that the, the, the yeast was the consistency of cheese by the time it had been pressed. So a very graphic description of their process. So a dropping system, basically. So that each of these two gars were fermented separately and blended at racking and bottling, which is interesting, but not unexpected. Nearly all the big breweries had different practices as to how they combined uh, the worts. This was a single type of beer, so it wasn't a party guile, but you can see that their system was set up that if they wanted to party guile, they could, and perhaps they did for some beers. So there, there's the details of, um, of the fermentation record. Uh, again, Martin Hoare said, pure cultures are not used, and if they got into trouble, they would get yeast from other breweries. Uh, and he noted, this is in 1928, that the present uh, yeast had been in use for 30 years, so around the turn of the uh, 20th century. Now, we're getting close to the end of the log, and you've got this thing called started. Now, started in this context means running the beer to racking. In the 19th century, it meant off to the vats for maturation. So it fermented for six days. 16C was the racking gravity, uh, was the racking temperature with gravity of 1014. So we've got about a 5% beer. No mention of dry hopping, but that would have been perhaps in a different uh, department uh, where they would, would bottle separately. Uh, the, the yeast was probably a mixed strain, so there would be some conditioning going on in or maturation in the cask. So 
dry hopping is a possibility, but not explicitly mentioned. So he also mentioned that the, the casks were uh, of Russian oak and not lined. And that's a, uh, that's a difference to um, Australian practice. Um, most Australian casks were pitched to avoid any contamination with the wood. So let's look at the recipe. So here's the recipe based on 23 liters, five gallon batch. Uh, so Marisotta is the safe choice for the uh, a modern equivalent. Uh, I have used crisp uh, Chevalier, which would be even better. I find that the Chevalier malt is slightly less biscuity than, than Marisotta, but it's still a good choice. Six row, uh, could be hard to find. Uh, I would suggest if you can't get six row uh, to use uh, a malt that's not too flavoursome. You, you, you don't want, you don't want too much biscuit or or some other flavor in there you want a fairly neutral slightly grainy malt uh, i use um a castle six row pilsner when i can get it uh, simply because it adds that graininess invert number three which i'll talk about on the next next slide and thomas Fawcett chocolate malt the the mass temperature to achieve a uh, a final that's high enough here, 1014, would be mashed higher than perhaps the log would indicate because modern malts are much more modified, much more highly modified. 70 minute boil, uh, EKGs and uh, Whitbread Goldings, if you can get them. If you can't get them, Fuggle was by far and away the uh, most often grown hop so you could substitute out with um, with Fuggle. Uh, yeast choice, uh, well, something with Whitbread in the title is probably a good idea. So any of those would be good. Dry hop if you like, and probably not, I'm, I'm not a fan of, of really high carbonation, but one and a half to two, probably um, a good good carbonation temperature. Invert sugar. Now, because we've invested, I use the term, the royal, the royal we have invested in a Thermomix, uh, to get some return on investment, as far as I'm concerned, I can make a sugar invert base. There are the details. You can read that for yourself. Now, importantly, it's the unholy mess uh, website which details how you make different types of brewers invert for the dilution method which is the simplest thing is buy some golden syrup from from Lyles uh, if you're a cheapskate just make your own invert base whichever way but the the easiest way is to use Lyles golden syrup and add in the blackstrap molasses in Australia, we've got a couple of brands that you can dip your finger in and taste it, and it tastes okay. Other ones tend to be quite harsh. They might have sulfites in. You do need to choose a good tasting molasses because that molasses will carry through into the flavor of the beer. It's subtle, but you need to get a good one. So I found on the internet this, this um, playing card, which was quite handy because it gives you the comparative colors of the Whitbread range. So we're, we're looking at a, a dark copper color for this beer, for this double brown. So I calculate the, color, the colors, as I mentioned in, um, uh, from Brewfather with the modern materials. And if you think it's coming out a bit too uh, pale, you can add a touch of caramel just to tint it up a bit. But it should be okay. Now we're gonna just uh, go through quickly an interpretation of, uh, of tooths. So tooths 
1936 had just celebrated its, its centenary in 1935. It was the lar largest brewery in the Southern Hemisphere. It actually comprised on this particular site, two breweries. They duplicated one in 1916. And they also had taken over another brewery a few blocks away. So it was a very, very big concern. What's left today is a chimney and the, uh, the newer of the two breweries, the others have been developed into units. Now bear in mind that Martin Hoare had been to, um, uh, had been to Whitford. He would be across the product range. In, in 1939, uh, Toos introduced the double brown ale. And I thought, oh, that's good. I'll, I'll look into this. Lots of advertising. Winter's chilly days, you know, winter beer. This is Australian winter, of course. And if you go suitably far inland, you will get uh, snow and other things happening. So, yeah, okay. They did a lot of print advertising. Uh, but by 1941, there was nothing left. There were no more adverts, and I'd say it was a casualty of the war uh, that this particular beer just uh, wasn't appropriate. So, we have some problems with this recipe because I do not have a production log. I don't know the OG, I don't know the ABV, or the recipe. So, this, given their um, uh, relationship with um, Sidney O. Neville, who was the MD of, um, uh, of Whitbread. Uh, the Tooth Brewery was founded by my mother's brothers. So I've seen in the Canberra uh, correspondence quite a bit from Whitbread to Tooth over time. Uh, so I, sus I suspect there was an amount of sharing of information or at least uh, Martin Hall, through his trip, would have been aware of Double Brown. So perhaps that's where the name came from. So if I look at the period between the wars in, um, in Australia, six row and two row, yeah, pretty much okay. Wouldn't have used invert, I don't believe. Uh, the, most of the beers were just using white cane sugar and caramel. Uh, there were protectionism of, um, of, of the hop industry in Australia and the brewers agreed to um, uh, buy 85% of their hops from Australian sources, mostly Tasmania. Uh, and out of that, the gold cluster and the straits uh, would typically be 25 to 75% mix and you could use a Whitbread Ale yeast or the Melbourne Ale yeast uh, would be also very appropriate. So here's an equivalent recipe to the, um, the Whitbread one, uh, slightly different. Uh, I brewed this one and uh, it's quite a characterful um, brown ale. Uh, which is a, a very misguided style, I think. Anyway, you've got that one there for your um, uh, records. Uh, as I said, you can sub out the Marisotta with, with Chevalier, uh, which would be probably easier, easier to get uh, for you than me. So later investigations, uh, I found that the double brown was actually a blend and wasn't a separately brewed beer. So we do actually have marketing just before World War II uh, to the fore here. So that completes my, my talk. I would just mention my contact details, they're on there. And that I, after five years, have decided that uh, it would be a good time to revise bronze brews. 
I, I have more information that's relevant and I want to finesse some of the information that's in there. So I've, I've withdrawn that one from sale at the moment. Uh, and later on this year, I'll re-release it with more recipes and uh, more good stuff. So happy to take any questions from you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Peter. Anyone got any questions? I've got a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Good. On one of the slides uh, of, for the Tooth Brewery, I was a little confused because it said Kent Brewery in a little sort of a banner, uh, but then underneath the, uh, the address is Sydney. Yeah. What, what does all that um, mean then? Well, uh, a, a, a quick potted history of, um, uh, of the brewery. It was founded by uh, uh, Robert Tooth and Charles Newnham in 1835. Uh, Robert Tooth had come from Kent. Uh, you would have noticed, I think, on the, the logo that they had there, uh, they have a, a horse, uh, Invicta which is the white horse of Kent. So it was because um, the Tooth family had come from Kent and their head brewer, which was Charles Newnham, uh, also from Kent. Uh, that's the link to why they called it the Kent Brewery. It comes from the founders of the brewery, the, the Tooths. Fair enough. Peter, I was going to ask about the sugars. Um, you mentioned that there was uh, normal white cane sugar in there and, and invert sugar. And I don't really know what invert sugar does or brings to the mix. What does it do with the flavour or whatever? Okay. Um, it, in, invert is... Uh, number one, invert isn't Belgian candy sugar. I think that's important that I state that right up front because Belgian candy sugar is made from beet and beet sugar doesn't have those um, uh, trace portions of, um, I'll just get my screen organized, that's better. You're all over the place. I've got you more organized now. Um, yeah, the, so the Belgian candy sugar doesn't, doesn't have the... Um, uh, that flavor element that you get from molasses. If there's one signature thing for British beers, it's in the use of invert sugar and the different grades of invert sugar uh, basically are different colors and different strengths. Cause you can go all the way from quite a pale color, which is about uh, Lyle's golden syrup all the way up to black invert. What the, um, what the ancient brewers, yeah, we call them ancient brewers, they, um, they liked invert because, because British breweries were repitching their yeast from batch to batch. Yeast health was pr of primary importance to them. And the, if you put ordinary cane sugar in, the yeast has to perform all of that work to convert uh, that sugar into something that is fermentable. So it does the inversion in the, in the fermentation itself. If you invert the sugar beforehand, the yeast has got a free run at it because it's already into the requisite, um, I can't quite remember, but the glucose and fructose and all the rest of it, it's all ready to, all ready to go. And, uh, and it lets the yeast uh, deal with it. One of the claims to fame of the Melbourne ale yeast was that it didn't um, become weak uh, when fermenting up to 50% raw sugar, which was an important thing because you know, even to this day, uh, the big breweries are using 
anything up to 30% sugar. So having a yeast, a yeast strain that could, could handle uh, sugar was important. So inversion was, uh, was one means of being able to do that. And they used to invert it with um, uh, sulfuric acid and then uh, neutralize that with whiting. Uh, and uh, if you care to look it up, there's um, 1901, the great poisoning of, um, <laughs> of, the, of the North uh, from contaminated arsenic in, uh, uh, arsenic contaminating the sulfuric acid when they did some inversion. Sweet. So, yeah, they, it's, it keeps your yeast happy is the simple answer. Yeah, uh, so is it more, it's more a practical flavor. measure for a healthy fermentation than it, than that it adds a flavor? Such. Mm. Um, it's basically normal table sugar is mostly sucrose based. Inversion is the process of breaking the sucrose down into glucose and fructose. So mm. yeast can take the glucose and uh, fructose and into its cell walls and um, metabolize it directly. For sucrose, it needs to first give um, an enzyme out called invertase, which actually you get in mash as well. And that actually breaks down the sucrose outside the walls and then it actually takes the glucose inside the walls for me met to metabol metabolize it. Um, so you need a healthy yeast with lots of nutrients to actually create this enzyme in order to um, metabolize sucrose and that's why um, inverted sugar it just metabolizes easier because it's just glucose and fructose and sucrose you can do it but you need more, more healthy cells and a lot of cells. Why do you need different colours? Oh, why do you need like darker or lighter invert sugars? Well, well, that's related to the styles. So just so, um, if so, we just talked about double brown, yeah. brown ale, mild ale, typically invert number three. Uh, pale ale, typically invert number one. I say typically because it depends on the era and it depends on the brewery. Some breweries, they just use number three for everything and you know, it, it, it does vary, but I'm, I'm just doing a, a horrible generalization. So light beers, lighter flavors, mild ales, they might use um, uh, invert number four, black invert, yeah. uh, and wouldn't use any uh, dark malts at all. Uh, you, you could have a mild ale, uh, that was malt based with malt coloring, or you could have a mild ale with invert sugar coloring only and a good dollop of caramel or in fact, the amount of um, beers that came out of um, some breweries uh, could range from stout to mild to something in between brown ale uh, was all done at priming with different priming sugars which included a lot of invert so the, you, you have a lot of lot of things to play with in terms of uh, <coughs> flavor and color when you use invert Look, I was going to just come back to the yeast some would say that giving the yeast all of those really simple sugars that they can just absorb means they don't start to build the metabolism to get the more complex sugars in in malt. So many people would say don't give them simple sugars including sucrose because it just it just delays it right so now they're not used as much. But I wanted to ask you Peter what's it what's it taste like I mean and can you compare it to something we might know like Yuki Brown or something I don't know. Um, yeah it's a long time since I've had Newcastle Brown um, and they don't make it um, like they used to like just about everything. Uh, it's it's a it's a because of the amount of hopping in it. Uh, I'd I'd hesitate to say it's it's IPA ish. Right. It's I I I didn't want to call it a brown IPA, but the hopping rate that's in there, it it is. It is quite, 
so you, you've got the the balance with the um, uh, with the invert, which provides a level of sweetness to the taste, even though it doesn't necessarily uh, uh, most of the sugar will attenuate, but you get a sweetness to the taste, and then you've got this big big whack of hops in there. Um, I, I quite liked it. It it, it mm. it's a full flavored beer. Let's put it that way. It's not <clears throat> right. it's, it's not your it's not your man's brown ale and it, it's probably would knock your nuki brown into a, the proverbial cocked hat. All right. Yeah. It, it, hopefully you've got enough data there that if you wanted to give it a crack, I'd be, uh, I'd be interested to know how it turns out because <clears throat> uh, obviously you've got to change your process details to match whatever system you're brewing on. Uh, and and that's a challenge in itself, uh, but at least the, there's hopefully enough uh, enough clues in there. And of course, you can always pop down to the London Metropolitan Archive if it's open under all the COVIDs and um, delve into all this stuff. But I've done all the hard work for you, really. You, you couldn't just make a beer smith file, could you, Peter? First, make it really simple. <laughs> Uh, I could send you, I could post an XML file if you like. Oh yeah, yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. let's do that. Cause, cause, um, yeah. I can export from, um, uh, from Brewfather. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll send it to, um, to Daz and then you can put it on wherever you want to put it. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. Do you, want the, do you want the Australian version or the English one? Why not both? <laughs> oh, look, look, absolutely no problem. <laughs> and what, what's everyone think about the sugar comment? Because the only time I use really simple sugar, so I'll use, I'll use glucose to carbonate in the bottle, particularly for strong beers, where the yeast are knackered, just to make it really simple for them to do the carbonation. But at this invert thing, I've, I've never really got it. I've never really got the Belgian ones either. I'd rather just add the molasses, but I've never tried them. So, I, you know, but it's just never fascinated me to use them. I've used things like straight molasses and pill and chillo and stuff, but yeah, I don't yeah. get those. Jack, you're a fan, aren't you? Yeah, I actually make quite a bit of candy sugar at home and I actually want to do a presentation about sugar, maybe by the end of this year. But um I think when we talk, when we're talking about invert sugar here, what we mean is actually um, sucrose-based sugar with lots of other um, impurities. Right. So, which is basically like the difference between golden syrup and uh, black treacle. Where candy sugar is very different. It's actually pure sugar that's been inverted, meaning yeah. it's uh, glucose and fructose, and then and, the uh, temperature pushed up to get um, Maillard reactions yeah. and caramelization. And that's also very different. The Maillard reactions are very different to caramelization and you get very different flavors depending on the two. You can actually create a lot of flavors just with different types of candy sugar as such. So when you talk about color for invert sugar, it's actually the impurities that are in there. Like I've used brown sugar and you don't get any effects. I get good taste from treacle. Um, I've used molasses and you really don't taste it. Um, but then candy sugar, it really depends. This, um, this candy sugar you get commercially, I've never found any candy sugar I've made commercially that really gave a full flavored malt caramelization flavor. But if I make it myself, it, it really almost overwhelms the beer. Um, it depends, but to do this yourself is really difficult because you're talking about minutes in which these reactions happen. But it, it's, a, it's a long talk, it's a whole talk in itself. And, but I actually think there's, a lot more to it than any of us uh, and most brewers know and understand. It's, 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 I've been reading a lot about it, researching, and it, it, it's just the more you read, the more you find out. It's, it's really complicated. Yeah. yeah, I'd say the same as that. I've been sort of inspired by Jax as well. I've been doing like a little bit of stuff with sugar, like invert sugar and uh, candy sugar as well. And it's, it's oh. amazing the range of flavors you can get from it like not just like caramel flavors but like deep fruity flavors as well and like yeah. a lot of color and depth like just but, but using that's why sugar, that, but. That, that's why i was saying that the the molasses that you use is is quite crucial because it's that flavor that will carry through yeah, i made yeah. a tropical stout uh and i just put 
straight molasses in there because I, I wanted to get that um, uh, really nice dark fruit thing going on in the background to play with the with the dark malts I put in there. Uh, not sure I quite got the balance between the two right, but I, I have got a very drinkable 7.5% stout for winter, so that's fine. <laughs> <clears throat> A lot of these old recipes use things we wouldn't do now, right? So, you know, sometimes breweries back then were doing stuff to save money. And and maybe that's not the best thing for the beer. It'd be quite interesting to try and get one of these old recipes, but then take out the, the faults yeah. maybe to get to what the beer was really meant or could have been. But well, I think Ron, Ron Pattinson said, like, if it if it was to save money, they'd use the same sugar all the time. But then right. sometimes they'd use two different sugars in one brew. And then if if it's just to save money, they wouldn't do that. Like right, it, they were the the logs that I've the logs that I've got. Um, they were brewing beers single guile of gravity point difference of perhaps five sg which looked on the face of it to be the same beer, but with just a couple of things different. They, they were brewing for particular markets. Um, it, you don't need to romanticize this because the production logs as a primary source actually tell you what they did. Uh, how you choose to interpret it in the light of history, etc., cetera, is, is different. I, a lot of the... Uh, a lot of the ingredients uh, that they use were constrained by government regulation, in particular gravity. And then you uh, you have to um, uh, use creativity, like the amount flake maize, as an example. Flake maize was very popular for a long period of time. Uh, flake maize was imported. It turned into flake barley during World War Two. Flake barley didn't need malting and as an adjunct. And then they used, when they ran out of flake barley, they used flaked oats. So a lot of the things were imposed due to um, World War I or World War II, uh, which didn't reflect into Australian brewing. Australian brewing was affected by sending you lot all the bloody sugar. So they all the shit sugar had to go into the the local brews so i can see substitutions um because of external events um, but these old logs and it worries me today that all the the current brews going on uh, and are being recorded on a computer system that you'll never ever get to see uh in 50 years time uh the one thing that whipper did when they sold sold out of brewing was that all the brewing books from all of their subsidiaries across the whole country went to the local archives. Uh, so without that, the, the information would have been totally lost. And, I, and I, I worry about what happens today for somebody trying to do it in the future to work out um, uh, what was going on, uh, would find it extremely hard. Yep. But they were, they were brewing in a in a way with the technology that more directly relates to the way we brew today as home brewers because we've got quite uh, high tech systems we have good quality materials um, and we don't have constraints so if you like the historical brewing record i like to think is, is as accurate as i can make it and then there's your base point and you can then go and experiment from there but not had out of all the haven't brewed all the beers in my book or the the guys at the brew club uh, or myself haven't brewed all of them but we've brewed a pretty representative sample and some have been more successful than others and some have just been just plain wow didn't know you could do that mm. so yeah it, it's a resource basically do, do we get a real sense of what the beers tasted, would have tasted like at that time? Because it's interesting you said that 
Peter, that um, in, in back in the day, the wooden barrels would have been pitch, whereas over here, probably they weren't. And if you can imagine the impact and the effect of, a, of an unpitched um, uh, barrel to, to, to the beer, it'd be quite interesting. Uh, so we won't, can't necessarily recreate that flavor uh, today, because even though some of us may use um, wooden, wooden casks or barrels, we've got methods of cleaning and sanitizing them effectively. But back in those days, maybe they didn't, I don't know. Well, I, I think they, I think they did. Uh, a, a lot of the reports of the brewers that went from Tous around the world, uh, they paid particular attention to the way um, cleaning and bottling was done. And uh, I, I think it's, uh, you know, Burton Unions, which were wooden vessels, they weren't there, in my view, to impart wood they were there because they were a big vessel and they steam cleaned them and they did all this other stuff that they did to them. They, they weren't, I don't, I don't think the old guys were deliberately trying in the, let's say this is the 20th century rather than the 19th century where they may not have known. I don't think they were trying to deliberately put off flame, what would have been considered off flavors in a running beer by by putting them in a, a cask, the cask was a container, and as soon as they could afford to go from wood and get rid of all the coopers and have metal in the 1950s, nearly everybody did so. So th this this idea of wood aging of a running beer just doesn't make sense. It, it's only in the in the cask for two weeks. Mm you steam clean it, it's, it's probably going to be okay. Yeah. Uh, different in Australia where uh, they would followed more the, the U S practice. And I've seen lots of things in the procurement logs about uh, pitch and they pitched the cakes and they, they weren't looking to have any beer flavor at all. Uh, the beer, not um, uh, the flavor changed. So. Yeah, so that's my take on on that. The others, of course, will have a different view, but um, I, I'm not talking export ales. I'm talking the drinking ales down the pub. Well, then, I've, I've obviously done well. You've um, not got many questions. I'm just livening up now. It's, I've oh, got one. It's almost six o'clock. Um, how, how do you find... Um, Australian homebrewers um, reactions to your you know your sort of historical recipes is there is there a general is there a good interest in recreating these brews or trying to revive them I mean I know that I mean we've got our own sort of historical brewing clubs here like the Durden Park Beer Circle that have done a lot of a lot of work into um, the old British styles um, and that in part has led to breweries like the Colonel, um, you know, creating their Imperial and, and Brown Stouts and things like that. Um, are, you, are you seeing much of that in, in Australia or have, have any of the commercial sort of craft breweries taken the lead on, on reviving styles as such? Um, yeah, the, the home brewing question is yes, uh, this, um, I have, uh, I've given several talks now uh, to homebrew clubs. Uh, I did Brisbane last week, uh, did Canberra a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we got, what, 20 odd people on this one, and typically anywhere between 10 and 20 people uh, have been very interested in whatever I've been talking about, which might be stout, might be you know, sparkling ale or recreating beers and stuff. Uh, I, as far as any uptake by craft breweries, uh, their whole ethos is to not be like the big guys. And the, the information that I have is predominantly from the big guys that uh, one brewery, uh, both of the breweries of the 20th century are defunct from those big breweries. Uh, and um, Tui's Brewery, uh, to which I gained access to 
60 years worth of records, uh, is an active brewery owned by Lion, uh, and they still make um, Old Ale. And that's a very distinctive style, or used to be. Uh, now you'd call it a dark mild, I think. Mm. Uh, so I, the ethos of the craft brewers is to be different. And uh, a lot of the beers in the book, of, um, in bronze brews in particular, from the 1970s, uh, people have um, brewed that because they remember drinking, that's what they drank down the pub. Uh, and I've had a lot of good feedback. Um, uh, the uh, two white horse pale ale from 1931 is um, one that I've brewed a lot, and it's a it's a good clean drinking pale ale, um, 4.7 percent. About the long term average in Australia is about four and a half. Um, and I've had lots of feedback. I've had more feedback about the Melbourne ale yeast, which. Uh, is a story I could share with you if you're interested. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, two disengaged um, a guy called Grove Johnson, in who was English, and he came out in 19, 1907 or something, and he was an analytical brewer, so he had he had chemistry as well as being a practical brewer. And he spent a long time in Australia. And around the beginning of the Great War, he isolated uh, an ale yeast that he called Melbourne Number One from a Ballarat brewery. And he went back to the UK in 1936 and he banked it in the National Yeast, um, yeast Bank over in East Anglia somewhere. And he banked it. And I was doing what researchers do, Googling this and that, and I found his name uh, in, um, in the East. Um, and then I talked very nicely to Chris White, who I've known for a few years. Uh, and he, um, he arranged to get a, a culture and turned it into uh, Melbourne Ale Yeast, WLP 059, which is in the, uh, in the vault, which means it's, a, it's an occasional release. And uh, I found it a, uh, a, a it, 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 gives, it gives a nice multi rounded profile to a beer that's got a lot of sugar in. It's, uh, it's a very, and I've used it for Pale ales, milds, stouts, um, IPA, grapefruit IPA, um, and it just chewed its way through and just not a neutral yeast, but a, a, a slightly to a, a more multi profile. It's, um, it's good yeast. What yeast was that again? Sorry. WLP 059, Melbourne Ale Yeast. It's in the vault, so it doesn't it doesn't get released all the time. But if you if you get a chance, uh, it's it's worth an experimentation. Oh, somebody's got one of those cloudy things. Is that, is that orange juice? Just one you final know? question, Peter. I think you said it was about six o'clock in the morning where you are. Please tell me that you are drinking a beer. No, I'm, I've 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 run out of water. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I have to I I have to survive the rest of the day, and I if I if I start drinking beer now, uh, I not good anyway. That'd be some pretty special dedication. So, uh, um, I've got a last question. If you have any more time, I look. Um, I, I'm fine. I I I had um, I had Hobbit breakfast number one when I got up. So I'll be ready for second breakfast when we're finished. <laughs> That's New Zealand, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> um, what about tasting notes in these old beer logs? From what I know, the tasting notes are not good, or they're usually very light touch. 
What's your experience with reading old tasting notes? The, um, that's a toughie because um, just like the colors, you, the colors in the logs are, well, I'll just think about this. It depends. Sometimes you will get a note on the bottom, especially in the, in the 19th century ones, something like splendid ale. And you go, right, well, that one's probably okay. Uh, the 20th century ones, you get a bit more analytical data, especially as you work through into the 50s and 60s. Uh, you get occasionally the colours, the tints. Uh, the bank slogs were interesting because they had, uh, that's banks up in Wolverhampton. Uh, they had the tint recorded both pre-fermentation and at racking. Uh, and you could see that uh, at racking uh, that they dropped what I presume to be lover bond uh, a few um, few degrees in colour, which is to be expected. But you never really know how they were measuring it uh, and whether it's comparable to the measurements of the day because the standards have changed. As to flavour descriptions very rare to get tasting notes. I, I, that's what I tend to use the um, uh, the newspapers and even with a pinch of salt with some of the advertising, if they said it was a dark brown ale, then it probably was dark brown or if it was golden uh, or amber, it, it, you get some cross reference. So if you've, if you've translated a, a log or transcribed a log and it's coming out, not, adjacent to the color that's been described in the press uh, but you 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 seldom get any um any tasting notes other than the uh the press representative that's been plied with alcohol probably wasn't in much state to um <laughs> to to report anything other than the bright shiny things that were in the brewery uh, yeah, it, it it is it is a um, it is a problem, but beers supposed to take taste apart from modern some of the modern stuff. Beer is supposed to taste like beer, so I think we could generally assume with a hopping rate of X and a eighty percent malt, twenty percent sugar ratio, you're going to get something that's going to be a similar to what we do today. It, it's we haven't had one of those big shifts in technology uh, where well we we might have if you talk about Anisa Bush or something, but a big shift in technology that that's producing some different substance. It's still beer, but, but yeah, it it's a it's a hard one without that information. Anyone got any other questions at all? Who's in craft work? <laughs> I, I don't get the reference, sorry. <laughs> this? What was the question? <laughs> Ken's saying I look like I'm in craft work. <laughs> uh, let's have a look. Oh yeah, you do actually, the dead one. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I couldn't resist. Uh, <laughs> It was only last week, wasn't it? I forgot his name. He died. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Flo was it Florian? Florian. Yeah. Yeah. Florian Schneider. Mm. Fantastic stuff. I'm a big fan. Not big that, enough to know his name, though. That, that's what's. I, I, I've been thinking that that um, I need some theme music for my talks. <laughs> Any thoughts? Uh, yeah. You've got it. There you go. I think Mark, Mark's brass band rendition of Craftwork <laughs> is probably your no worries. Right, right theme tune, Peter. I'll do you a special arrangement. Oh, okay. Which Craftwork song? Oh. I've always liked Radioactivity, actually. Oh, okay. Nice. 
I, I was I was lucky. Uh, I, I went to I didn't go to the really flash one a few years ago at the at the Opera House, but I went to the the more grungy one at the Enmore Theatre. Uh, oh, would be a long time ago now. It might be the early two thousands, and they did the full craftwork thing. And that's a small theatre, and oh, it was great. Is that up in Newtown? Is it Enmore Theatre? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Craftworks Hokey Cokey. <laughs> What's yeah. this? It's a Bill Bailey routine. It's really good. Oh, that. <laughs> he does Hokey Cokey uh, in, in the style of Craftwork. It's definitely I'll put him on. Here we go. <laughs> right. I'll I'll save with that one later. That looks really good. <laughs> good link. Thank, thanks, Rob. Hey, has anybody found any uh, WLP 059 on sale in the UK? I'm struggling. It, it's only it's only a limited release. It hasn't been yeah. released for about a year. But write to White Lab, write to your local uh, homebrew shop and say, demand, demand, demand. Yeah, we'll get get Rob Neal, the malt miller, onto it. He'll he'll sort it out. Yeah, because the more people that ask for it, the more chance we've got of our local homebrew shop up the road uh, is uh, is White Labs um, distributor, and uh, the more energy there is towards the product, the more chance there is it'll get released. Mm. It's White Labs choose what they release, though, don't they? Periodically, right? What White Labs choose? They're yeah, not, they're not off the shelf. You, you it. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt your bottling. <laughs> hey Lee, what's wrong with your keg? The White Labs distribution model is generally that they shift as much of it off to commercial as they can, and anything that's left over goes to the homebrew shops. So. It is quite a tough one to get hold of their stuff if it's not something that they're already shipping out. Right. Um, yeah, I, I've somebody mentioned Colonel. I I haven't been to the UK now for two years, and probably I sort of had a vague idea that I might might in my retirement pop over again and but I'm not sure I'll be dredging through any more um, records as such, but um, that, this doesn't seem very likely this year or next at the moment. So it's a bit unfortunate. What's yeah, the homebrew we... scene like in Australia, Peter? Is it very advanced compared to, to other countries? It's got lots of good equipment and, and, and ingredients available. Is that homebrew club scene quite active and lively? Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Yes and yes. So yeah, that, that, <laughs> I think that answers all of those. No, it, seriously, um, discuss the, the the big the big thing that I've noticed in the last five years, probably influenced by uh, grandfather, is, is the use of single vessel systems. Right. It's it's put a whole new impetus of a whole new bunch of people have come into the the hobby. Uh, because of the simplicity of those systems uh, and uh, now there's all these other um, knockoffs of of the same principle uh, my um, my one vessel system I have a three vessel system and a one vessel system uh, which is part of my three vessel system which makes perfect sense uh, it it uses a ten dollar uh, five pound pot from uh, Woolworths as um, as a malt pipe uh, in a uh, two pound fifty uh, garden sale uh, washing copper, which is made of stainless steel, and I got my pump and um, Auburn's uh, controller, and I can step mash. I can do just about everything, and I. I don't use my three vessel system very often anymore. It's just very easy. So I, I haven't paid 800, 900, 
thousand dollars or whatever the grandfather is um mine's a bit more a bit more uh cost effective so so the one vessel system is um it's been a big change uh homebrew comps and the level of bjcp judging uh the the new south wales competition um we we had our committee of which i i'm unfortunately the i am fortunately the president um we decided collectively that we would run the competition this year in september covid notwithstanding um but decided to cap the number of entries to 300 so that did an eoi with the judges to see whether the there would be sufficient people willing to uh judge check with the venue about how many people we could have and um we decided we're going to go for it with the um, with a proviso on the on the entry site that you know if it all goes pear-shaped um we'll give you your money back but not the bottles uh ingredients yep um fireman castle brace um yeast from wherever uh really good and, and of course the local um uh local malts because uh the the chinese market has been denied to uh they put a huge tariff on uh would expect to see a lot more interest by the the big maltsters in the local market soon because they won't be able to supply uh effectively to china uh but we've also seen the uh craft maltsters the small guys uh there's a bunch down in southern New South Wales called Voyager, and they brought back heritage barley. And this is, this is, I wouldn't call it heritage. It's only the eighties. Eighties was just around the corner, as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's schooner malt, which is a, a very um, serviceable malt. Uh, so yeah, the, the, it's, the, there's a there's a lot of things going on. It's um, it's very active. But I get yeah, everything. I think you, I think only, I did. you only have to look at the number of BJCB judges there are in Australia, which is like two and a half times. Yeah. Ken's frozen. Yeah, is he frozen for everyone? <laughs> <laughs> oh well. Even that, who he's being very, very still. <laughs> hard to tell. You've caught him with his earnestness. Oh, oh, no, he's back, he's back. Uh, the whole internet him. froze then, I think. <laughs> no, pretty much <laughs> you. <laughs> you. Oh, it was me. <laughs> <laughs> you, you got, um, you got to the start very of the Australian homebrew judges. Where, where did I get to? You just said there were a lot of judges in Australia, to which the answer is yes. Yes, I was saying there were, there were two and a half times the number of judges that we that we have here and we've been accelerating rapidly in, in the last um, couple of years um well one thing i was going to ask is does everybody do no chill in australia does everybody um a, a good proportion it, mm -hmm. the uh like it's, it seems it seems ages ago, but back in January we were on level three water restrictions, which meant that you weren't allowed to water anything. Uh, so yeah, it, it it is a it is a constraint the um, the water supply. I I do no chill occasionally, um, um, but since I've been doing uh, been doing a lot more with um, hop stands. And just knocking the the temperature down to about eighty, uh, do my hop stand for twenty minutes, uh, and then oh, I've already put the immersion chiller in, so I, I tend just to, and I've got a big copper beastie that uh, I would probably go through about fifty liters of water. But people that are that are on tank water or or inland, you know, it's it's it's, it's a real issue. So, uh, 
I don't think anybody's done a survey as to how many people know chill. Uh, my experience with no chill is um, you do have to adjust your recipe. It, it's a, it, instead of doing a hop stand, you could add your hops straight to the, to the cube uh, for the same sort of effect. Uh, you, you gotta be, you gotta be, if you're just doing a, a straight pale ale that isn't overly anything, it's, it's going to be fine. Um, but brewing a bag is really what all these one, one vessel systems are just shiny versions of brewing a bag. And, uh, and when I get stuck and I've got a big, big grist, I'll get me bag out and give it a, give it a wash and then it goes. So yeah, brewing a bag and, um, and no chill. You, you can still buy a lot of, uh, do you have work kits? We have work kits here that are, um, 20 liters of what's usually slightly higher gravity. And then you add a little bit of water to it and ferment away. Do you have that? It's very rare here now, Peter. Mm. Um, uh, there were a couple of places that that uh, that touched on them for a while. The full wort kits, where you, you, know, you would buy a 25 litre cam of it, and then it was just uh, uh, lazy as anything, really. They were mm. good quality, but I've not seen any for a couple of years. The malt miller did them for a while, and I, mm. I did a few of them as well. Uh, they were popular, but um, I, I've not seen them now for some time. I don't think you can get them in the UK anymore. Anybody seen them? Mm. No, I knew, the one, I knew the really basic ones where it's like pre-hopped malt extract and then, yeah, you dilute it down a bit, but not the ones that Mark's talking about. God, it's making me thirsty. What Lee's doing there? Look at all that. Oh. <laughs> why are you Why are you bottling, Lee? Did you see something just fall in that last one? <laughs> yeah. I'm sending you. I'm bottling a triple. Ooh. Are you going to mail it out to all of us? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> you want to get a canner, and then you could. It'd be easy to send me 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 one then. <laughs> it's loosely based on um, triple carmelite. Ooh. But uh, I put four grains in. I had some spell that they gave me a um, brew card, so I threw that in as well. So it's got four grains, not three. Other than that, it should be similar. Is that carmelite as in nuns? Yeah. Mm. Right. Oh, no, uh, <laughs> uh, monks. Maybe I can dive around the tomorrow, morally, actually, over there. Yeah, something's come up. <laughs> Welcome. Right, I'm going to make some noise, put the lids on. He's not, he's not capping on foam, you know. No. Uh, it's very naughty. Yeah. yeah. I'm not seeing any star sand or, you know, being sprayed around either. Fairly unsettling product. The you bottles know. went through the bottles went through the dishwasher, then they were rinsed with stars and uh, and the tops were dipped in them as well. The caps are in here for the star sands. There's, there's plenty of foam. You I'm are you capping now because you've let the CO2 push the air out for a little bit. I'm capping now, yeah. Yeah. And the table <laughs> straight away. And the table's full now. So <laughs> All right. You'd have to do half. But I would not So, so how, how much have you drunk for quality control purposes so far? Or are you going to just finish off the what's in the fermenter? Yeah, I'll, I'll just try what's left at the end. Fair enough. Cool. Well, thank you for an awesome what's talk, Peter. That was no really problem good. at all. Really good. Thanks. Thanks. Really good. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, yeah. No worries. Buy me book. <laughs> show some, show some, show some appreciation. No, yeah. I tried I enjoyed it, guys. One, but it had been recalled. <laughs> I, only the first one. The other two are still there. <laughs> Not really. what, what's the word I meant? <laughs> Not available. Revised. Yeah, if anyone Revised. does want to buy the books, the link, links on the web page. To Lulu, is that that where it's from? 
Yeah, it's uh, they're all print on demand, which is um, apart from the nice. one, two, three, the, the four boxes that I bought uh, in the expectation of going to various events, uh, which are now COVID. So we were going to have the Australian National Convention in Melbourne in September, October. Um, that's not going to happen. So I have a lot of hard copies here. Anyway, <laughs> I dare say somebody will take pity on me eventually. <laughs> Do you mind if I just ask a quick question before uh, you go? Uh, you were talking about molasses and the importance of getting the right quality. Is there, what, um, are, are there any makes in particular which you would say would be a good one which might you might be able to get over in the UK? Uh, or, uh, or for us to have a look and see if we can do, should I say? Yeah, I, I, I don't know, to be honest. Um, uh, I think you just pop into Sainsbury's, uh, loosen the top, put your finger in quietly and find the security cameras and just give it a taste. Uh, I, I can vouch for Billington. Billington? Yeah, which I thought was Australian, actually. Yeah. Billington, you've never heard of them. Billington. Yeah, I've used them. It's good. Yeah, I've used Bellington. It's good, yeah. But just a little. Bellington it yeah, is. A, 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 a 500 gram jar will last you for, for a long time. Uh... Okay, well, I might um, consider my second breakfast shortly then. Um, <laughs> And I'd like to leave you with this thought so that uh, as we pass the solstice, you're heading to winter and we're heading for summer. So it's all good to the same. <laughs> yeah. You noticed how the nights are drawing in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Stop that. Uh, it's still dark here. Just checking. <laughs> no. Oh, yeah. Very good. Thanks, guys. Um, appreciate it. Uh, hope you um, you got something out of it, and uh, certainly did. Yeah. I'll catch you yeah. next time. Thanks. Thank you very much, right. Peter. Thanks, Peter. Cheers very much. Cool.